Well, let's take a look at some nomenclatural case studies. We're going to start with the case of Isotrema or Aristolochia. So there's different circumscriptions for these plants. So these are viney plants, at least the ones occurring in the southeastern United States, the ones that we're going to be talking about. And there's two species which have sometimes been called Isotrema and sometimes Aristolochia. So let's open up Weekly's flora. We've got the one here from 2015. This is the flora of the southeast. And we look under <clears throat> here under the key for the Aristolochiaceae. This is a family that includes Aristolochia and Isotrema, if you recognize Isotrema as a separate genus. And we come down here and we find that there is Isotrema and there is Aristolochia. And if we look under the, the species of Isotrema, there are the two species that occur in the, in the southeast. So weekly recognizes two genera here. They're both legitimate genera, that is, they follow all the rules of naming, and they are both correct according to weekly. Let's look at another treatment. So perhaps I should say this is a treatment. The next treatment is something we find on the web. This is a website maintained by the USDA. This is also a treatment. It is not published on paper, but it is counts as a treatment published electronically in this case. And now let's do a search on that website for Isotrema. And what we should come up with is they recognize Isotrema is a bunch of listings of Isotrema. But we don't get that. What we get here are recognized names. So these names here, coming up in blue, are all the recognized names. So these are names that this treatment recognizes as valid. And then underneath that, here, And here, these are synonyms. So in other words, here's our two species from the southeast down here. Isotrema macrophyllum is a synonym, according to the USDA website here, of Aristolochia macrophyllum. Isotrema tomentosa is a synonym of Aristolochia tomentosa. So they don't recognize iso <coughs> Isotrema here as a valid genus. It's still legitimate, but it's not correct according to this treatment. Let's look at another treatment. This is the treatment of the flora of North America. We're going to pull the information of this from the website, but it is also available printed. So there are books that cover the flora of North America. So it's not just a website here. And if we look up Aristolochia in this, in this case, in the website of the flora of North America, we find that it is recognized. The author of this part of this treatment, so sometimes treatments, big treatments, especially like a big flora of a whole continent are like this, are cert certain sections are written by uh, certain people, and here's the author of this genus, Aristolochia, and actually probably of the whole family, Aristolochiaceae. But he's speaking for the flora of North America here, and you see here it is recognized as Aristolochia here. And Isotrema, if we could find Isotrema in this database, it would be placed in synonymy. Probably if we go follow each of these, we would find that Isotrema is placed in synonymy with Aristolochia. Well, it's almost certain that the reason that the USDA placed Isotrema into synonymy with Aristolochia is because of this treatment in the flora of North America. The USDA website tends to follow the treatments in the flora of North America. So we've seen two different treatments now of Aristolochia, either as Isotrema or as Aristolochia. So why are they doing this? What's the basis, the scientific basis for this? There is some scientific basis for this. And that goes back to this paper that was written in 2005 
a phylogeny of the family Aristolochiaceae. So what we can see in this phylogenetic tree and in these annotations that are down here at the top or the base of the tree, however you want to look at it, are some different circumscriptions. So what basically what we've got down here in these names are different circumscriptions. So I'm going to look at a couple of those. Here, if we follow down here, is this, across here, come back down, and we look at that branch, we can see that this branch is monophyletic. We can use our little scissors here to cut that branch off, and we see we get one cut, which removes that branch. So we have a monophyletic group, and that is, in a large sense, the genus Aristolochia. And so we say Aristolochia sensu, Latu, or Lato, in the large sense. So all of those things come into Aristolochia in the large sense then. Let's look over here. Here is another monophyletic group. We can take our little scissors and cut here at the base. You can see it is a monophyletic group. And this group of, sometimes called Aristolochia, can be separated off as Isotrema. So this group then is Aristolochia in the narrow sense or Isotrema. And if we separate Isotrema off in that way, we've also got to go and separate these other species of, that used to be called Aristolochia, like here, take off this monophyletic group, like that. This would be Aristolochia in the strict sense. Sensu stricto. So you see there are different circumscriptions of Aristolochia here. If we have a circumscription of Aristolochia in the wide sense, it includes everything in this group. If we have it in the narrow sense, we have to separate off Aristolochia and Isotrema, and we'd have to separate off other genera here, which we're not going to talk about in this lecture, but these are all then separated off into other uh, genera, or they can be separated off into other genera. So different authors have just broken up this phylogeny in different ways and taken different types of circumscriptions as being correct in their treatment. Let's look at another example, the case of Veronica. Here's two very different looking plants. This one on the right has traditionally been called Veronica. And on the right, this is a Australian, New Zealand, etc. plant, and it has traditionally been called Hebe. Hebe is a very famous plant, or a very famous genus, in Australia and New Zealand. It is grown um, in gardens everywhere across the countries, a very attractive plant, and so every gardener pretty much knows it. 
in those countries. So problems started with a new phylogeny of Veronica. So not too long ago, a new phylogeny of Veronica and Hebe, which were always known to be pretty closely related, a new phylogeny was formed. And when this was formed, we found that we could divide this phylogeny into two sections. Here's one of them. And here is the other. This first section is Veronica. This section section is Hebe. And if we look at Hebe, we look at the base of that tree, part of the tree where Hebe is, we see we can draw our little scissors there and we can make one cut and we can lift Hebe off so Hebe is monophyletic. If we look over at Veronica, we can make a cut down here and lift Veronica off. Uh-oh, but wait, we've got to make another cut up here. Really in the same place we've made this one already. We've got to make another cut up here to take Hebe off. So Veronica is not monophyletic. Now, there is nothing in the code of nomenclature that says we cannot have non-monophyletic groups. There's nothing that says that all groups have to be monophyletic, all groups that are recognized. So it's fine that Veronica is not monophyletic, but almost all contemporary taxonomists want to create monophyletic groups. It is really an anathema to them to have a group uh, a recognized name group which they know to be non-monophyletic. We'll talk in other parts of this course about why that is, but for right now we're just going to accept the fact that it's really a bad thing. And so there's a problem here. We either have to accept that Veronica, as it's currently circumscribed, is non-monophyletic, and basically that's a no-no, or we have to do something to make Veronica monophyletic. And really, about the only thing we can do is we can take and we can put all these Hebes and all these Veronicas in one new group and make this a new Veronica sensulatu. Sensulato. And that is, in fact, exactly what was done. So here is a paper by some authors from Australia and New Zealand. They're looking at the southern hemisphere of Veronica's, i.e. Hebe plus some other sections. And if you look closely down here, they say in order to render Veronica monophyletic, right? They want Veronica to be monophyletic. They're going to transfer all of these genera. There's Hebe there. They're going to put them all in Veronica, into a subgenus of Veronica, but they go all there. So they're changing the description of Veronica. And then if we go and we look at the website for the floor of New Zealand, and we look for any of these Veronicas that belong in that <clears throat> right-hand clade, which I, I'm sorry, the left-hand clade, which I circled in blue, here's one of them, we will see that we have a synonym of Hebe now. There it is in synonyms. That is a synonym. Here's another one, this Veronica, 
as a Hebe synonym. So they used to be Hebe, now they are Veronica. That is great for taxonomists. Taxonomists are not normal people. They did not have all of these plants growing in their gardens. And although they may have loved Hebes, they didn't love them as much as gardeners. And if we then now go and we look at Wikipedia and we look for Hebe, there it is. Hebe is still recognized on Wikipedia. Now, no taxonomist is going to think that Wikipedia is a valid treatment, is a valid taxonomic treatment. So no taxonomist is going to get really too upset about this, but it just shows that there is this really strong difference between how a taxonomist might think, always wanting monophyletic groups, and how someone who is a more um, broad-minded gardener might think, who loves these plants and has always called them Hebe, they may want to still call them Hebe even though the scientific name has officially changed, according to the authors of this study, uh, Floor of New Zealand and this study. Those are the people who say that it's changed, and we see that someone has made a decision not to follow their taxonomic advice, and they've kept them as Hebe. We looked a little bit before at this type specimen of Renealmia, Renealmia cardindicii by Rusby. Look down there and see the holotype designation. We can enlarge that a little bit. And there it is, Renealmia cardindicii Rusby holotype. However, notice there's another part of this label. This is an annotation label, by the way. And we can see that there is another name on here. There's some abbreviations, and it's a subspecies. Let's follow through about that a little bit, and first of all, look at what this thing, Renealmia, Resortia looks like, which might be the same as Renealmia cardesii, at least according to these authors who put the annotation label on. And here's one of those authors, Mass. Moss is the person who put the annotation label on. Okay, here's Rumiata resortia. Here's its distribution in South America and Central America. It's a very attractive plant, very, very large. Let's look into uh, Moss's treatment of Flora Neotropica. So you remember we talked a little bit about this in an earlier video. Flora Neotropica number 18. This is a monograph on Renealmia. and it's by Paul Moss. And here is his treatment. Now, uh, it's a monograph, right? It's not new species descriptions. Well, a monograph can include new species descriptions, but it often doesn't. It's his treatment of all the Renealmias that he knows about. So here's his treatment of Renealmia resortia. And here's our authors now, with their names spelled out, Ruiz at, at Pavon and Poppig and Endlicher as the two second authors. So we know here that Poppig and Endlicher did something. They moved or moved the plant or they combined it or they split it or something. And Ruiz and Pavon were the original people who described a species that is now called Renealmia resortia. If you wanted to look at descriptions for the subspecies, they're down here. And this is a description then of all of them that whole species, not just the subspecies. Now let's turn to the next page, and we've got a description of our subspecies. This is the one that has got the annotation label. The annotation label is for this subspecies. And now this is a list of the synonymy. It's 
So it's a synonymy of everything that Moss says is the same as Renealmia thysoidea, subspecies thysoidea. And if we look down here, here is Renealmia cardindicii by Rusby. Here is where it was published. There's the holotype. It's in New York. It was by this collector. Actually, it wasn't collected by Rusby. He just named it, but he was a different collector. It's their collection number. It's in the New York Botanical Gardens Herbarium. And <clears throat> so there's an annotation label on this specimen, on this specimen by M. Cardesens 884 in New York. There's an annotation label by Moss, and Moss says that thing is the same as this. And so there we are. There's Moss's annotation on the holotype by Rus Rusby. And we can see that, in his opinion, it is the same uh, plant as Renealmia thysoidea. So he's essentially moved that one plant into this species. If we go and we look at Popper and Endlicher's original description, we can find that. It's amazing what you can find on the internet from 1838. And there is Popper and Endlicher's Renealmia thrasoidea. And now, under their synonymy, here's the synonymy of Renealmia thrasoidea, according to them. Here is Ruiz and Pavan's description, their name, and that Amomum thrissoidium. So Pavan and Pavon said, here's a new species. It is in the genus Amomum. Popig and Endlicher came and said, yep, we agree that's a new species, but it is really not Amomum. It's a Renealmia, and so we put it in Renealmia. And Moss came around and wrote a monograph on all Renealmias, and he said, oh, I agree with Popig and Endlicher. This is Renealmia thrissoidea, except I'm going to put it in a subspecies. It's one of the many variants of Renealmia thrissoidea. So that's the story with Renealmia thrissoidea and that herbarium specimen, that type herbarium specimen we looked at earlier. We also looked at agave earlier. We were looking at this when we had different names for the same species. And so we had these two different names for agave, agave virginica by Linnaeus and agave pallida by Salisbury. And of course, Linnaeus's name had precedence on, based on the principle of priority. So this is a clear case of synonymy based on the principle of priority. So agave virginica. But now what about if a taxonomist comes along and says it is not an agave? What if someone says it is Manfreda? That is, it belongs a man in the genus Manfreda. So these are two alternative names now. alternative genera for the same plant. So in one case, we have Linnaeus, and in one case, we have Salisbury x rose. And you know what x means already from a previous lecture. So who's right? Is Linnaeus right, or as 
are Salisbury and Rose, right? Well, this depends on the judgment of a taxonomist. Both of these names are legitimate. They both were constructed according to the rules. It's true one is earlier, but that doesn't matter. This isn't a case of homonyms. It's a case of synonymy, and it's different genera. And so what we've got to do here is we've got to make a taxonomic decision. A taxonomist has to decide which name is correct. Well, let's look at the difference between agave and manfreda. Before we go on any farther and look at a treatment, let's look at what the difference between these two proposed genera is. So we'll look at a key. So here's a key. And if we take this first couplet of the key, we go to number two, say we have an inferior ovary, that's going to take us where we want to go. Then we find stem subterranean leaf apex flexible. That tells us it's Manfreda. And that looks like that. Stems above ground, leaf apex rigid, go to three. And under three, there's two choices, but we're just going to look at that one choice. So for three, we are going to go here, which is agave. And there is agave. So there's two characteristics which separate Manfreda and agave, not just according to this key, but according to people who separate them. And that is whether the stems are subterranean versus above ground, whether the leaf apex is flexible or rigid. So rigid, by a rigid apex, we mean here, there's a little, like a little spine on all of these apices. And you can kind of see it even right there. You run into one of these plants, you know it because they stab you. You run into one of these plants over here, well, you just kind of brush it off. It doesn't have a strong spine at the tip of the leaf, so you hardly know you've walked by it. Okay, so there's some pretty significant differences between agave and manfreda. So you might want to, as a taxonomist, say, well, I'm going to accept those as different. And so here's a treatment that does that. This is a treatment that is on the web also. This is called the plant list. And we can take a look at what it shows on the plant list by following this link. Here it is, and there's the plant list for Manfreda virginica. And we see that it has two authorities, Linnaeus and Salisbury x rose. And if we were to look down, we would see a couple things down here. One of the things we should see is agave virginica. There it is from Linnaeus, and it is listed here as a synonym. You might notice that there's another agave virginica, but this is Baker, and it's illegitimate. And think for a minute why that named by Baker, Agave Virginica, might be illegitimate. I hope you thought about that. So it's illegitimate because the name Agave Virginica had already been used by Linnaeus. Obviously, Baker didn't know about Linnaeus's work, and so it, didn't, it violated the code. It wasn't the earliest use of that name. So it's an illegitimate use here. But it's out there in the literature, and so they've listed it here in the plant list as a synonym of
of a synonym of Manfreda Virginica, but an illegitimate synonym. Another thing we've talked about earlier in the, the lec these lectures is agave pallida. Agave pallida by Salisbury, and again it's listed as illegitimate because this is a later use of that, that name. So you can see there are legitimate and illegitimate names here listed in synonymy, and the, effect, the uh, accepted name in this treatment is Manfreda Virginica. And this is essentially what we're seeing here back here on this slide. We're just seeing the same list that we saw on the plant list. I've just printed it here on the slide so you have that for reference. So we could say a word or two about what the plant list is. The plant list is a very interesting site. It is a treatment, but it's a special kind of treatment. It's an aggregator. That is, it pulls information from other websites, essentially other treatments. So here's other treatments here. Some of them are listed over here on the left so you can know where they are and you can look on a page to find their abbreviations. I'm not going to follow through on these links. I'm just going to say that this site, the plant list, pulls them in from this other, these other websites, pulls information in, and the people who are running it try to make a um, determination of what is the best taxonomy that is out there today. So the plant list is a very nice resource kind of to get an overview of what people think is a correct name. <clears throat> of course, only you can decide which name is right, but you might want to use the plant list when you're making that decision as you can check your references and go and look what, to see what other people have said about the status of a certain name. Let's take a look at a publication in which new species are published. This is a publication by Helen Kennedy, and it is about species of the genus Calathea, which is in the family Marantaceae, and it's in Costa Rica. If we want to know where this was published, unfortunately we have to go all the way down to the bottom of this page, and we see here that it is published in the journal Novum, which is a journal that is devoted to the publication of new species. And it was published in 2011, before the rules were changed for whether there had to be an English or a Latin description. So what we're going to look for here is we're going to look for a Latin description when we find the new species. Let's go down a bit farther and find our first new species description. And here it is, Calathea recurvata. The authority for that is Helen Kennedy, and it's a new species, species nova. There's a type locality distinguished. That is, it says the type came from this place in Costa Rica. And in fact, she even gives the um, GPS coordinates for that. The type was collected in 1972. So there was quite a period of time between the collection of the material and the publication of the name. And that is really not unusual in taxonomy, a science that moves very slowly. And then she tells you that um, here's the holotype. It's in CR, which is the herbarium of Costa Rica, the national herbarium there. And if you wanted to find it there, you would go and you'd look in the folders for Calathea, and you would look for Kennedy's collection 1680. And that's how you would know you would have the type. Of course, it would also be marked. There's also isotypes, and she has shown where she has deposited those. Now, after we've got the formalities out of the way, what the name is, who's the author, all of those things, there is a Latin description. As I say, there had to be a Latin description given the time that she wrote this. The Latin description is very small. And that's not uncommon there in 2011, 2010, just before the requirements were changed that the description had to be in English. The English description, which follows, and I'm not going to highlight it because it goes on, this whole next column on the right is English description. And that's going to go on a little bit farther even. Here's a picture of the plant. 
in 2011, we still weren't doing a lot of color in publications, and so scientific publications, and so it's in black and white. If it were published today, it would be published in color. There is the um, pictures of the spe new species, and here are some bracts. Bracts are little leaf-like organs that occur under clusters of flowers, and you see how they're kind of curved at the end there. So this curving at the end is what recurvata refers to. They are, the bracts are recurved like that, curved downwards. Here's the rest of the English description down here at the base underneath those photographs. We continue down onto the next page, more English description. Now she gives you a little bit about the distribution and about the phenology. The phenology means the flowering times of this. And then she talks about the um, whether this is a, a conserved plant or not, that is whether it's a, a threatened plant. And she says it, based on these criteria, the IUCN red loose category, it's of least concern. They, it num occurs in a number of localities in a number of places in Costa Rica. And so she's not suggesting that it needs to be on any kind of endangered list. And here you can see that she's saying the specific epithet Recurvata refers to those recurved margins of the bracts, which I've talked about already. There's then a brief discussion, and then she does something very interesting, which I especially wanted to point out. She defines paratypes. So the paratypes are other type specimens, and they're used to define the variability within this species. So she's saying, if you want to know what Calathea recurvata looks like, Aside from what the type specimen shows you and what the isotypes show you, which are all from the same locality, you can look at these other specimens, these paratypes, and that will tell you what I think, what I, Helen Kennedy, think this species is like. Now, that's a very important thing to do in some cases, and this species of Calathea is one of those cases because all around the neotropics, the New World tropics, we find species of Calathea that have these bracts that are like this. Not all of them are recurved. Some of them look a little bit different, but they have these bracts that are, um, in, are inserted on different sides of a central axis, and the bracts are these kind of boat-shaped bracts. So there's a whole bunch of species that are very similar to each other, and Helen wants you to know exactly what this one looks like. Okay, so that's our description of a new species. She describes other new species in here, but I think we've seen what we need to to see how paratypes especially are used.